write down three things that you notice. So I think we talked about this last class, our invitation to notice. All right. So on your notebook, underneath the sentence that you just wrote, you're going to write down three things that you notice. Now, those three things can be anything. It can be punctuation. It could be capitalization. It could be something that the sentence is saying. There's no wrong answer because it's simply your observation. So three things that you notice, and then we're going to discuss. So let's see here. Um, John Rogers. What's one thing you notice? There's a, which one? All right. So we have three commas after Sarah, after my cousin, after the after the word weekend. All right. So we'll come back to the comments in a second. Let me see here. Peter, what do you notice? I'm getting help on the She's getting help on the project, right? That's right. Um, and do we know who she is? Sarah, right? Yeah, so they're using a pronoun, but we know she is Sarah. Yes. Massimo, what else do you notice? Um, she was able to get help with the project. She was able to get help with the project, right? And we're going back to that pronoun she, which is Sarah. Uh, Robbie, what did you notice? That it uses the word and to define what would usually be two separate sentences. All right, so <laughs> John's giving you props over there. Um, all right, so we use the word and to combine two sentences. So if I look at this first one, Sarah, my cousin, came to visit this weekend, is that a complete sentence? No, for you. Who's the subject? Sarah, Sarah. Sarah, so we have a subject. Do we have a verb? What's a verb? An action. Is Sarah doing something? She came to visit. So she came to visit, right? So a complete sentence? Sarah came. Yes. Yes. What about she helped me with a project? Do we have a subject? Yes. What's the subject? 
She. She. What's the verb? Help. 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 And then it finishes right because you have to have it has to be a complete thought. It can't just be like she helped. So she helped me with a project. Complete sentence. Yes. So we have two complete sentences combined with a comma fanboy. What is that called? When you have two complete sentences combined with a comma fanboy, what do we call it? Uh, compound, compound sentence. Compound sentence. <coughs> Good job, guys. Now, what about this part here? These two commas. Why do we have these two commas? Yeah, highlight the last one. It what? Is a person? Mm -hmm. I know what it is, but I forgot what it's called. So, huh? Uh, it's the highlight the Sarah's the cousin. It tells us the person, right? It tells us Sarah is the cousin. <gasps> Hold on. Oh no. This thing glitches. Hold on.
situation. All right, so poetry is organized by lines and stanzas. So lines are literally the lines, right? Stanzas are the equivalent of paragraphs. So they're the chunks of lines, if you will. lines and stanzas. Point of view can be first person, second or third. So point of view, first person, second, or third. Also a common one, I think. You're right. 
Man versus society. So man versus man, again, is like uh, two individuals who are opposed um, or against each other or have uh, contrasting ideas or beliefs or anything like that. Um, man versus self is like this internal conflict with yourself. And then man versus society, maybe it's like um, the norms or expectations of society uh, versus an individual. Based on real or imaginary, um, they're both based on real life and imaginary. More often than they're not, they're based on real life. But they can be imaginary. Right? 
now you're not talking, you're not saying they don't look well, like, oh, they don't, they don't feel well. You're talking about they look cool, right? Do people still say that? Sometimes, right? Or for example, um, we use the word, well, we, you guys use the word lit now, right? Or do we, do we move past that already? I still hear lit, right? No? I've never been part of that school, no. <laughs> or smoke, right? When you're like, you don't want no smoke, right? I hear that all the time. Yes? <laughs> yes? Yeah. All right. So what does smoke mean literally? Like in denotative meaning in the dictionary, what does it mean? The stuff from the fire. Smoke. The stuff what? The stuff from the fire. Right, right. It's caused by fire, right? Um, but the connotation... Well, what is the connotation? You don't want like this backlash, right? Kind of? Yes? Do we get where we're going here? Denotation is the dictionary meaning of a word. Connotation is the feelings that, it, it has an additional meaning. It's become, um, the purpose is used for something else. And so it creates a certain type of feeling. Just to clarify, connotation is the feeling a word creates. So if you're using it, if you're not using the denotative meaning of a word, and you're using slang, it may create a, a, an opposite effect than the actual, than what the word actually means. Does that make sense? Have I lost you guys? Give me a thumbs up if that makes sense. So when you are told you look sick, like, oh my God, are you feeling well? You look sick. Probably negative connotation because they're saying you don't look well at all, right? But if they say your shoes are sick, positive connotation because now it's being used in a separate, in a different way. Yes? Rogers. Huh? 13. Write down 13. Yeah, you can use the computer. Wait, hold on. 
And then the last line says, all you own is yourself. How can we restate that? All you own is yourself. What are they trying to say? If all you own is yourself, then what is the one thing that you truly, that truly belongs to you? You, you right? So the only thing that truly belongs to you is you. So 
then the second part is to annotate the poem so you are underlining and labeling all poetic devices. Now you may not be familiar with all of them, you may know the common ones like simile, metaphor, personification, but that's why I gave you that pink list. That pink list has a whole bunch of poetic devices. Um, what is one poetic device that we see here? Do we see any similes, metaphors, repetition, um, personification? I think I heard someone say something. A little bit of alliteration. Alliteration? What do you? What is uh, the alliteration? Lady. Now, is it alliteration or is it repetition? It's repetition, right? So I'm going to circle it and put repetition. Another thing that I noticed was connotation. So there are words there that may invoke certain feelings, um, not so happy feelings. Anybody have any idea which ones may may invoke not so happy feelings? Yeah, Evan. Leave. Leave. I'm gonna put a negative sign so it's negative connotation. Which other word would invoke not so happy feelings? Nothing. And in this case, even go is not being used in a positive manner, right? Remember, the way that it's used is how how that the connotation that it has, right? So I'm gonna put negative there. So I've got repetition and negative connotation. On this side, purpose. I need to explain how one poetic device contributes to theme and how one contributes to tone. So I'm gonna use repetition to tie it to theme. What is the, but before we fill this out, what do you think is the theme of this poem or the lesson of the poem? To move on. To move on. Don't stay, don't waste time holding on to something that's not yours. Move on with your life. Um, don't let other things hold you back um, because you're, you don't want to let them go or, you know, something along those lines, yes? Can we agree that that's the, a message? Yes. So then I'm going to say um, repetition contributes to theme because how does the repetition of let it go, let it, let it, let it contribute to the theme that we just said it was? Yes, yeah, Evan? It's telling you to do something. It's telling you to move on, right? More specifically, it's telling you let it go, move on. Because it tells the reader Or 
her. So negative times, negative times that you can contribute to tell them because it shows the author is sad to let go. Okay. 